Miami and for the past three years have been um, the co-convener of the Fresh Expressions Movement in Florida. And um, so it's been a joy to learn the past three years to do some Fresh Expressions myself and starts in the past three years. And now to really work at a church um, where I'm working to empower others as well to watch some Fresh Expressions in Miami. And um, I also have the great joy of teaching a little bit about what we've learned and, um, and hearing what you're doing and kind of working together to continue this work we do. I wouldn't say that it was a dramatic turn or anything, it just kind of faded out of my life for a little while. Um, I moved around to a couple different places and just never really settled into, into a place for long enough to, to have a church home. I mean, I grew up in the church. Um, it's hard to feel in a community, I feel like at my age. God tends to work in small ways that people overlook. I, I know that change is hard for almost everybody. But one of the things that as Christians we, we need to be willing to do is to accept change and welcome change and, and be a part of it. Fresh Expressions is a way of doing church with new people in new places by new ways. Uh, the word expression and the term fresh expression speaks to the diversity of movements that we believe the Holy Spirit is already stirring within people. A fresh expression could be 10 people. We believe a fresh expression might be 300 people packed into a coffee shop. We believe a fresh expression could be a missional expression of faith where people gather each week to do good in their community in the name of Jesus. I feel like the church is somewhere that needs to be somewhere that people can go and, and learn what to do and how to be how to be better, uh, how to love more, how to, how to be more welcoming, and how to move forward as a community together rather than than just one church here and one church there, um, sort of pull together to, to move forward. That's what I would love to see. Too many churches are only concerned about filling the pews and the seats and making the, uh, all the bills be paid. And instead we need to be about reaching out to the whole community, everybody, and inviting them and helping them see that God loves them just, just the way they are. We need to be willing to embrace people in their, in their situation, the way they live their lives. I know a lot of people have expressed that they don't want their church to go away. They don't want they don't want it to be just replaced by something new. And no, of course not. Um, the beauty of Fresh Expressions that I see is that not only can it work together with the traditional existing church, but it has to work together. People express their love for people in many different ways. And God does the same for all of us. And so why should we hold it to a certain way when there's multiple ways to show God's love for people? Jesus said, come to me, all you who are heavy laden. He takes on our burdens. He cares about us, but he expects us to care about each other also. Wipe away all the rules, wipe away all the you know discussions, wipe away all the the inconsistencies um, and, and all the finer things and just just love. Just love, feel comfort, and do the best you can. And that's definitely who, who I hope and feel that God is. Start with why. 
And um, he says there, people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. And what you do simply proves what you believe. And there he really talks about in the book how future generations are concerned with why you are doing something. And I think if many of us are honest, and if we did a little interview with some folks in our churches and said, why do you do this? They might have a blank stare on their face. Well, I can tell you what I do, right? Um, but tell you why I, I do it, it might be a little hard for some folks to do that. And so I thought it's important for us to start with fresh expressions as to kind of why. Why fresh expressions? Why do we need it? What is it? Um, another quote from him is, value is not determined by those who set the price. Value is determined by those who choose to pay it. So those who choose to pay it are really who? Those who are hoping come to our church. Those who are hoping will kind of engage in the faith. And really kind of the value in it is kind of determined by those that are outside of the church. And then Henry Form sums it up best. If I had to ask, if I had asked people what they wanted, he said, they would have said a faster horse. Right? A faster horse. And so part of what I do when I talk to groups about fresh expressions is I talk really about why we need it. And if we look outside and we look at the statistics of the church, if we get kind of out of our own little bubble, we see that the statistics really kind of tell the story. Um, oftentimes, I like to talk about this when I talk about local churches as well. Our numbers really do tell a story, but oftentimes we're so caught up in the work of doing church that we really don't stop and look at the numbers of our local church or possibly the country. And so we start a little bit today letting those statistics tell the story. Now, for many here, this is the story, possibly. For some of you, this is not the story. Um, but most um, scholars say this will be the story. <laughs> um, and so you might be in a smaller church, or you might be in a larger, pretty healthy church. Um, but even the larger church pastors in our conference um, have come to really embrace fresh expressions, as they too have seen um, now a decline um, in their numbers and they're giving, and for the first time, they're having to stop and say, wait a minute, all this stuff that we've done, it's just, it's not really working anymore for some reason. Um, and so they, the numbers of our country are now reflected in many of their churches as well. And so we see here 22% of Americans are religiously unaffiliated. 18% um, are white evangelical Protestants, 60% are mainline Protestants, 8% African-American Protestants, 3% Latino Protestant. And then we also see, same statistics there, um, and then what we see is the percentage of population attending a Christian church each, each weekend is projected to continue to decline all the way through 2020. And so we see here really the population attending church on a week on a weekend in 2020 would be 14.7% of our population compared to 1990, which was 20%. And so even when we look at that, only 20% of the population was actually attending a church, right? Um, I wonder why even then back in 1990 we weren't saying, well, what's going on here? What's, what's happening, right? And then we also look at the generations kind of involved in church. So we have builders born before 1946, the boomers, the busters, and then um, the bridgers. And so we see that percentage has gone down. How many of you all does that look familiar to your current church right now? Um, that possibly the majority of the people in your church are those that were born before 1946. Maybe some, maybe others. Maybe it depends on when your church was birthed. And then we also see this church attendance. So attend church each week, roughly about 20%. We know that's kind of going it down. Not going to Sunday morning, 40%. And then we have don't go but plain would if attended, if invited. And half of these say they do, but they don't. So if you look at this, we have basically, you know, in large numbers, about 80% of our population that's not involved in a faith community. 
And so when we put it all together, there's at least 40% of our population for which the Sunday morning worship service model will not reach. We need to have churches that focus on this percentage and on the other percentage. Both are necessary. And so I want to take a moment in your little book here. There's a place. Um, and on the Y page, it says your church. And so I'd like for you to take a moment and fill this out, whether it's your church as a pastor or maybe the church you um, are leaving, whatever it may be, and fill this out. Who goes to your church? What does your church do? When does it do it? Where does it do it? And why does it do it? So if you could take a moment and fill that out. Really the five W's of your own church. And part why, you know, I like to do this exercise is because I really think the five W's of our own churches really give us a lot of the why as to, as to why we need fresh expressions, right? We can, we can really look at our own church um, and not just kind of look like this, but maybe even dig a little bit more into the data, and we'll talk about that later, and really be able to see why we need fresh expressions. We also know that most institutions have a life cycle. Don't they? And the same like most institutions do, churches do as well. And so we see that in the beginning, there's a growth period, right? It's missional. We're doing something new. We're reaching out. And um, that's a foundation and growth period. So some of you all might have newer churches and maybe even have experienced that as a church. Uh, but there's a certain amount of energy that goes by that, goes with that. It's characterized by a clear belief system, right? If someone's gonna sign up to something that they can't see, oftentimes they're really gonna know why they're doing it. Healthy questions and focused activity. When you're starting something new, you don't have a lot of money to waste, right? And you haven't been wasting the same money for years. <laughs> um, and so you really do have to be focused and clear about where you're going and what you're doing. Uh, but then, like most organizations, you kind of reach a point um, that's a stabilization period. So it's characterized by lapsing momentum and the need to refocus the mission to emerging new social contexts, right? Um, and then you possibly have a decline. And that's really an institutionalized period. So characterized by operational, ideological, and ethical doubt that cannot remember what made the organization successful. Um, so oftentimes, if the institution doesn't look back and refocus and find um, kind of its meaning all over again in a new place, in a new time, it begins to do what? To decline, right? So we know that McDonald's was kind of experiencing a little bit of decline. And probably about a year and a half ago, they did something. Does anyone remember? To kind of refresh, to bring in a new crowd of folks. They started offering breakfast all day, and, and specifically in bigger cities, right? So breakfast wasn't only at one time, uh, but now you can get an Ed McMuffin um, all day long. And so they had kind of this set menu, but it actually brought in this whole new resurgence of clients that wanted breakfast all day or at the end of the day, or if they were just coming in from the club at, you know, whatever time or recovering at 2 p.m. in the day they could go to McDonald's and get breakfast. Another fast food giant is Burger King. So Burger King actually started in Miami, if you didn't know, and some of the past CEOs have actually been Methodist. Um, but they went um, through a time where they really were trying to figure out who they were. 
And um, one of the ways that they kind of revamped themselves, actually, um, the, the board at the time said, actually, we're going to bring in all new people. So we're going we're gonna to run our company now as a startup. So we're no longer an institution. We're going to shave back a lot of our employees, shave back the number of our employees, and we're going to hire younger, hungrier people to run this giant, right? And so that's what they did. And so they actually, a kid I used to babysit for um, is the youngest, was hired as the youngest CFO at the age of 26 of Burger King. And they ran the whole company like a startup, offering now, you know, beer at certain Burger Kings, new menus, burger bars, all of these things, really trying and testing. Um, and for the board, they knew this could either crash, right? <laughs> or this could go really, really well. And so luckily, kind of it's gone pretty well for the most part, too. This also happened, I've been in the development world a little bit, uh, with things that we're doing with our church, but there's one developer who we chose to work with us, and um, this developer as well, after the market crash, he said, you know, I really need to move into a new direction. I have this kind of condo luxury market, but there has to be something else out there. And so what he did is he hired all 28-year-olds to be the principals of his development firms and created kind of a new product that now is a signature product of how they do things. And so these are examples of companies stopping and saying something, some, there could be a huge decline here, right? And working in ways to reinvent themselves. Part of that personnel sometimes. Part of that's changing what you offer or when you offer it. Um, so. I like to share these stories just because it's important for us to know as the church that we're not the only ones that are really being affected by a cultural shift, right? By this like technological revolution. Um, many of you probably know people that have retired from one career at about 55 and are looking to another career. My mom's an insurance agent, so she just sold her agency. She can't quite get you know, how people could buy insurance online. What are they thinking, right? And so she's having to shift and move into a new career. And it's so funny because she's going through all of this while I'm working with a church that needs to kind of reinvent itself. And for years, we just found all of these similarities. Um, kind of, she has, uh, she's a very people person. So all of her, she's like, all of my clientele is aging, right? And so rather than kind of reinvent herself in the insurance world, she decided just to sell, right? Um, and in many places in our churches, we also are, are selling some parts, right, or merging in some places. So I think it's important for us to know as leaders, um, and many of us as business people, because that's we have to put that hat on, um, that, that often we're not the only ones dealing with this, right? It's not just like... The church is horrible, our message is old, is Jesus really real, right? Like, none of that's true. Um, the whole country is really, the whole world really is kind of readjusting to this new reality. So I hope we can find hope in that, that we're not the only ones kind of sitting at the top or towards the bottom <laughs> asking, how do we restart ourselves? Um, so hopefully that can give us hope. So why we need fresh expressions and why do they matter? Um, and I think for many of us in our churches, they mobilize God's mission force and establish inherited congregations. Um, and so part of that is just even talking about fresh expressions, even talking about something new, in some ways possibly helps rally your church around a new vision, right? Around a new marker, whatever that might be. Um, some of you here, there's um, all kinds of fresh expression words we use, like inherited congregations. Um, but one of the, the cultural shifts that's happening um, is that people are no longer inheriting churches. And so um, our bishop, Bishop Carter Group in South Georgia, and he's the first of four generations not to live on his family's property. Anybody here have that as an example? You're the first one that just kind of left, didn't go back, right? <laughs> And so, and actually, his, both of his siblings don't live on the family property, which means what? They don't go to the family church, right? <coughs> they don't type the family church. So oftentimes in smaller communities, what we're seeing, and kind of a larger cultural shift in general with millennials, is people are moving to bigger cities, aren't they? 
um, they're wanting to live where more stuff is happening, or possibly they just have jobs that have taken away, and I think maybe in Pennsylvania, you might know factories and all of those things. The world is changing, people are kind of moving, um, and for years, churches really functioned on the model of, well, the, ne the next generation will keep this up, right? Um, but that's just not happening anymore. And there's no real reason to point a finger. It's just the reality of kind of what it is. Um, in my church, we have an interesting um, dilemma. We are in a city, but the people that started our church, who are, or didn't start it, they were the children of those, or the grandchildren of those who started the church in um, 1896. And so they really counted on their children to kind of continue that. But all their children moved out of Miami and went to Orlando. <laughs> And so we have this whole section, this whole age of people who really were to continue those traditions and continue tithing and continue teaching Sunday school who have all moved somewhere else. They didn't inherit their parents' church. And then Fresh Expressions created the capacity for a mixed economy church, providing space for innovation, innovative mission, and existing structures. And so just a few words about another kind of key word is mixed economy or really kind of mixed ecology. And, and so that's really a church that has both the traditional service on Sunday morning, right, but also has fresh expressions happening at the same time. And really those two things possibly could even happen um, simultaneously or feed one another. Um, one of my favorite Fresh Expression stories comes from Western North Carolina, and there was a pastor who was a um, previous paddle boarder, Olympic paddle boarder. And he, his church is right by the Nantahala, and so during the summer, um, he thought, well, what would it mean if I started a church on the river? There's all these people that come in, um, what, if I, what if I could do that? And so he began just to make friends on the river, just paddle boarding with some of the sport suppliers, and then he made friends with the guy who owned the bar on the river, and the guy said, yeah, you can have this space if you want a worship service. Here, go ahead, go for it. And he was working in a church um, where Bishop Carter would say he was underappointed. And so he had a lot of gifts, he was paid 40 hours a week, but there wasn't a lot going on. And, um, and the church people were totally happy with that, right? Just have a good service for a Sunday. We'll leave a good offering. And, and that's just all we want from you. Um, but in his heart, he wanted to do more, right? And so he asked his DS for permission to start this river church. And so they started this river church, and it happens on Sunday mornings on the Nantahala River. And then after that, they go paddle boarding or have some kind of breakfast or whatever it might be together and it's drawn all kinds of new people, specifically families, to the church. And the river church, right? So not the actual physical building, but the river church. And they take up an offering there, you know, after about six months, they said, well, we're going to take an offering um, because the, the main church kind of pays for itself, all this offering is going to go to build, build wells in Haiti. And so now they've built 39 wells in Haiti and have taken four trips over there as <laughs> The river church, right? But what happens when you have the river church and you have families coming? Families oftentimes have what? Kids. And so how do kids learn about Jesus, right? How does Christian education happen within a fresh expression? And we're kind of exploring new ideas there, but one thing that's happened and provided a bridge to the main institutional church was Sunday school for children. So he said, you know what? One of the people said, can we bring our kid to Sunday school? And the pastor said, sure, that's great. Bring him to Sunday school. The people asked for it. And so it provides this bridge back and forth. And so some of the people in the institutional church that kind of live on a missional edge will say, can I go to River Church for a few months, pastor? Is that okay? The pastor's like, sure, come on over. So they go and they meet new people. And then some people from the River Church also go back to kind of the main institutional church um, to get Christian education for their children or for themselves. And so in many ways, that's a mixed economy church, a church that has several different diverse things going on. So there's a phrase that um, I learned when I was in youth ministry, and um, we use this oftentimes with youth, asking them to do new things, whether it's pray every day or something like that. 
And um, we say, we always do what we've always done, we'll always get what we've always got. And so this phrase has always stuck with me. Um, if I always go to McDonald's, I'm always going to get it for me, right? <laughs> That's just kind of true. But, <laughs> um, so I've always said kind of, this is a true phrase, right? Until I got to um, the church that I'm currently at. And um, most people were under that impression. If we just do what we've always done, better, then we'll get the results, right? But after a while, it actually proved to be not true, right? Doing the same things that we've always done aren't producing the same results that we've always, that we've always gotten. And so that was really kind of a tough reality for us to live with. Well, let's try this again, and let's try it with more robust passion, right? And let's try it with 10 more hospitality ushers. And we're going to have not Folgers coffee, but we're going to get Starbucks, right? So we're going to do it better. And we're going to see, you know, we're going to have what we had in the 50s. Um, but we're seeing now that that's not always the case, right? And so part of working with our congregations is helping them to understand um, this big reality. Um, it's important as well because what I've seen and kind of in some churches I've worked at is some shaming from older generations to younger generations, right? Um, so why aren't you teaching Sunday school all of a sudden? Like, wh why don't you teach Sunday school? And this comes from a woman who's 83 who never worked, right? Um, and stayed home with two kids and badgering young moms about why they don't teach Sunday school. Well, if you just would teach Sunday school and spend 15 hours a week on your lesson, then we will have what we had before, right? Uh, but we're seeing that that's, that's not true. Um, so it's important to have these conversations as we change the culture of kind of our church. So the second W is who. Who do you know that does not go to church? <clears throat> why do they not go to church? Who do you know that doesn't go to church? And, why, and, it, and you know what? We often don't think about this, but it might be a family member. Right? Sometimes we just got to think real close, and we can name five or six people. Um, so who do you know that doesn't go to church and why? And it's interesting generationally. So I always say the person I know who doesn't go to church is my little sister. And so she's two years younger than me. And I grew up, we went to church every week. We were in all the choirs. We went on all the trips. My mom was a chaperone. This was, my mom came every Wednesday to kids club and did the snack. This was our life, probably the center of our life even, for the most part. Um, but my little sister, she was a part of that. I think she got her third grade Bible. And then she started doing volleyball, right? And so volleyball just took over. They traveled. That's how my mom really got out of going to church every week as well, um, traveling with volleyball. So there's no particular, with my little sister, there's no real anger towards the church. She just kind of drifted away, right? Um, so the Church of England and um, the British Methodist Church are really those that started doing fresh expressions um, about 20 years ago, um, and even a little bit before that, probably the early 90s. They kind of saw what was ahead, and they said, we really need some new, fresh ways of doing church. And that really came through bishops and people that were higher up who gave pastors permission um, to do that. And... Um, so there were three initial categories that they kind of named. Um, Christians, those who are existing church-going Christians. De-church, those who have had some previous meaningful contact with the church community over a period in their lifetime that have since left. And non-church, those who have had no meaningful contact with the church community during their lifetime. And so non-church could also be um, unchurched. So these were kind of the three initial categories that they would put someone in. And so we've named some of those already, haven't we? Those that are de-churched. They came to church maybe as a young person, but um, were turned off, or even someone in their early 30s and couldn't handle the language um, during a political season. Or maybe those that are unchurched. They've actually never been to church and don't understand 
would go. Okay. Now they're seeing in England those that have grown up in a fresh expression. So this refers to someone who's been a part of a fresh expression from early childhood. Simple de church, those who began being part of church either as an adult, teenager, or a child, but left church for a period of more than two years before attending the fresh expressions of church. Complex de church, those who began being part of a church either as an adult, teenager, or a child, but left the church for a period of more than two years, returning to church, and have since joined the fresh expressions. Simple non-church, those who were not part of a church before attending the Fresh Expression of Church. And complex non-church, those who were not part of a church before attending church, prior to attending the Fresh Expression of Church. And I can send to anyone this full presentation you can get back. Um, but this really was a study put on by the church army um, in England. So they got funding, and for a year, they went to all the Fresh Expressions in the UK, and really kind of these six characters emerge. Now on your paper, I think those that have emerged in our work here so far um, are those that are de-churched, went to church, no longer go to church, and then there are those subcategories where it's open de-churched, um, so someone who's left church um, but is open to coming back to church. Um, so these are a lot of the folks I work with through our yoga chapel at First University of Miami. Many of them are first-generation immigrants. They were raised Catholic. They left the church. They moved to America. They don't really go back to the church most of the time for Fordham, out of routine, Sunday morning. Sunday is Monday in Miami. We don't really you know, go to church. Um, and, but they're open to faith, and they're open to spirituality. So yoga chapel on a Wednesday, we pray. I like to pray. I have no problem with prayer. I love God. Yeah. Oh, a pastor? You're even a woman? That's even better. Great. Let me come and talk to you outside of yoga chapel. And so that's really the folks that I saw at yoga chapel. And it's important to really form missional strategies around who you're working with, right? Um, so I knew with the open D church folks at Yoga Chapel, that I can talk about God right away, that I can pray, um, all of those things were totally fine um, with them. And that would be different though if there was a group that gathered that was closed to church. So closed is, I had this hurtful experience and I'm actually pretty closed off to church in general. I don't know what I think about God, definitely don't know what I think Church. So possibly with a closed de church model, the strategy might be, the missional strategy might be a bit different. So currently right now, our church, we moved out of our building, and our offices are in a co-working space called WeWork. Some of you might have heard of WeWork. I think they're in some larger cities, and they're around the world. And so our goal from the beginning was to start a service in WeWork. And of course, when we first went to one of the first we worked, they were like, oh, sure, yeah, you can have a service. We're like, oh, they just want us to sign a contract. This will be very different when we go into the WeWork, right? And so they built the new WeWork downtown, and we went in, and one of the people that works at the desk, his name is Tyler, and he's responsible for writing all the welcome cards to all the new members that have their office in WeWork. And so in our office building, there's 14 floors of offices, and they're like Royal Caribbean's renting four floors for a year as they build their new office somewhere else. But then there's also architecture firms, law firms, new startups, whoever it might be. And really the job of WeWork in some ways is the job of a club, or even some might say a church. But the people that work at WeWork, the building managers, don't really focus on the plumbing. They focus on building community and he didn't tell us that right up front, you know. And then they put the logo on, so you give the logo, and it was like a month. I'm like, do they not want to write that we're a church on our logo, you know, on our door? What's going on here? Which I was like, but I understand. That's fine, right? And so little by little, we kind of got to know WeWork, and they got to know us a little bit. And later on, Tyler told us, you know, I was a little fearful what this church kind of would be like. Um, but you all are completely different than I ever thought about church. And I don't know if I'll ever come to your church, but I'm really glad to know you all. So 
Part of what we do at our church is a homeless ministry, so we started to do peanut butter and jelly parties at WeWork. And now everyone calls me the mayor of WeWork because I know everyone at WeWork and they know me, right? And so it creates this whole new, different dynamic, right? And so pretty soon, hopefully in the next few months, we'll start a service there called The Story, right? Not The Story Church, just The Story, and we're inviting people to share their stories. And so really our discipleship plan and our mission plan looks very different than Yoga Chapel, right? Where I could go right in and I could pray and I'm automatically the pastor and there's this trust. But we've had to work a long time on kind of building trust, right? And getting to know people. And so then we have a plan of kind of the speakers that we'll bring in. And it's not until next October that we're actually bringing someone in to talk about the Bible. Um, but a different kind of way to think about the Bible. Um, for those who are kind of curious. Um, so there's different missional plans for each of these different groups that kind of we work with. Some take longer, depending on where they are, but this is why a little, a little later we'll talk about listening, why listening is so important, and really knowing the context, because that really determines kind of your missional and discipleship plan. So then there are those that are unchurched, they've never been to church before, um, but they're open to church, um, and then there are some that are closed to church not really open to church, not really open to God for a variety of reasons. Well, we've talked about why we need fresh expressions and really who, the who fresh expressions are for, right? And that's important to remember as we go through this. So fresh expressions um, predominantly aren't for the people that are already in your church who just want to form something new or have decided they actually don't want to come to church on Sunday, so let's do it some other way, just with our same group, right? Um, but it's for people that are, no, that are not in the church. And now we're going to spend a little bit of time on what. And so a fresh expression of church catalyzes new expressions of church with new people and new places and um, so new people, new places, new ways. Now, sometimes I think about, um, that, you know, really I think if you have, um, you know, at least the new people, um, maybe you have the new way, but you don't have the new place. Or maybe you have the new place, but you don't have the new way. And so um, we encountered a church in Key West, and they um, have worked with local musicians, and they hire one every week, and they have Cafe Church, and um, it does start at like 10 a.m., but they have all new people coming to it, people who haven't been to church before. And they hire local musicians to play the music, and, you know, one guy comes the first, the first week of the month, the other guy comes the second, and it's people that have not darkened church doors in years. And the pastor told me, I said, Terry, I heard you were doing this incredible thing down in Key West. It's fresh expression. She's like, we're not a fresh expression. We meet in a church. Like, we're not a fresh expression. I'm like, you totally are a fresh expression. These are all new people. And you're doing this in a new way. Your cafe church is coffee and you sharing a little bit of an inspirational story and listening to inspirational music. This is definitely a fresh expression. So sometimes um, in the fresh expressions world, when you're living kind of in a bubble, um, some are very quick to say, that is a fresh expression, or that isn't a fresh expression. And even our bishop put a lot of pressure on me. We have to make sure that these people aren't just cracking up and thinking they're having fresh expressions. I'm like, just let them explore. Like, <laughs> maybe if they think it enough, it'll be coming, you know? We won't add them to our list, but let's not tell them right away, like, you're not this. <laughs> Fit into this box. Um, so some folks, when they hear this, they say, well, we, we actually, we do a church service, but it's in a bar, so we're not a fresh expression. I'm like, no, you're in a new place. You're reaching new people that would never come to your church ever, right? So just because you're doing a hymn church at a bar and using the old hymns doesn't mean that you're not a fresh expression. Um, so I always warn people when I talk about new people, new places, new ways, because sometimes people think, well, I have to check every single one of these boxes, right, for this to be a fresh expression. But I really think... New people is the most important part, and then being able to do it in a new way or in a new place is also important. So in Fresh Expressions, we like to kind of think about this image of a dock. Um, I was just at St. Simon's Island, and this is kind of what I saw. It was really quite sad. There were kind of all these docks, and then the water was kind of way, way out, right? Kind of a sad reality. And so when this happens, um, you know, what do we do at times? 
what could you do? If you kind of had this dock and it, it didn't quite meet the water, um, you couldn't really bring the water back to you, right? Kind of how do you, or the water kind of comes in and it comes out, how do you really solve this problem? When we had a group of rowers come from Canada, they come to our Methodist camp in Leesburg every year, and they usually come when the councils are training, and um, they would bring their own floating docks um, because of this very thing. They didn't know kind of where this would be, so they'd ship them down, bring them back up to Canada, and so really they could have a dock, they could have a pillar wherever they are because it's floated, right? And so this is a bit more flexible, isn't it? You could really put the dock, you know, wherever you want. It could be out kind of in the middle of the lake, right? It could come back to the center of the lake. You see here that there was, you know, one dock, and then they built a dock beside it that had kind of floating, floating mechanisms here. And so really we like to use this image with fresh expressions because oftentimes the church is kind of, you know, dried up, right? The water's gone out. And we're like, we're just here, and the water's there, and we don't really know what to do, how do we reach? And really, this idea of a floating dock helps remind us of the importance of really being able to be flexible and agile, and to move and go kind of where the water is and where the people are. And I like this image of the two docks next to each other. So you have the older dock, which is still there, and clearly the water is there now, right? The old dock's not in sand. But then what they did is they built a new dock beside it. Now they didn't blow up the old dock, right? <laughs> so uh, kind of what we've encountered in Florida with some of our younger clergy coming in is they just want to come and blow up the old dock, right? Um, possibly in their preaching. <laughs> um, possibly in just reckless decisions that are made to kind of get to this new dock, right? Sometimes we feel like we have to blow up the old dock to get to the new dock, right? But we don't always have to do that. And part of the integrity of Fresh Expressions is realizing that both docks matter, right? And realizing that that one dock needs the other dock um, for a variety of reasons. Um, so that's happened in some churches, and pastor will come in and blow up the dock, and eight people leave, and now you know they're going to have to be paid half as much, right? <laughs> Or the budget's going to have to decrease by half as much because they blew up the, the old dock, right? Which gives them really no funds or time to actually create the floating dock. So it's important as we work in terms of fresh expressions and we do what we do, we realize the importance of both of these docks. And so we have here really kind of the church on one side and then the people on the other. And we have option one, um, just to stay that way, right? Option one, we just stay as we are. Church over here, the people over there. That's just how it is, right? Option two would possibly be to build a bridge. So come on over on the bridge. So we're going to build a bridge to you. Um, the bridge might be BBS, right? Here's the bridge to you. Come on over. Um, so that's option two, and that's you know, wonderfully successful most of the time. And then we have option three, where we actually bring the church or some semblance of a church over to people. They don't actually have to cross over the bridge to find Jesus. So some of these images are always helpful when talking to people about fresh expressions because I can only imagine many of you have learned about fresh expressions before and part of your task is really working with your church to kind of create this culture. Right? And so it'll be important for the church that you're working with to know that you're not going to blow up their dock, right? <laughs> um, and this is where many of us as pastors, we sit in this very interesting moment in time um, where we really have to do both, right? We really have to care for both. And so we need to show up and maybe help, you know, decorate the chrismons, right? Uh, and really learn about the chrismons and create a really great service about the Christmas, right? And at the same time, we really need to learn how to kayak and get to know the kayaking community, right? And possibly start a church with people that are kayaking, right? So we have this very interesting place in time as pastors. And we're really balancing in many ways the old with the new and constantly negotiating in our mind where we need to spend our time 
do and both are very important, right? Both are very important. Okay, now on your paper here, I want you to work alone right now. And at the bottom it says, what makes church, church? If you could only keep five things to be church, which five below would they be? Circle the five you believe are essential to being church. So you could only choose five. 